Hey everybody, welcome back to Living Traditions Homestead. Well, it's time once again for us to do one of the videos where you guys get to ask us questions directly about our homestead and our life and all of the things going on around here. We today are sitting in the greenhouse, our third greenhouse, the newest greenhouse. It's very big because not only is it beautiful in here and the temperature is controlled by our ventilation system, but it is so windy today. Right, we actually had a big string of storms move through last night, which was nice. Uh, we have actually gone a few weeks without any rain, so it was nice to get a little bit of rain last night. But today it is just so windy as that kind of moves back out. So we decided to be in here so that you guys can hear us a little better. But you might hear the sides of the greenhouse kind of flapping in the wind a little bit. So you'll have to put up with that, but uh, it's going to be much better than outside. We've had really a hot summer and the storm system that came through overnight has brought some cool temperatures for us for the next three days. Right. It seems like then we're going to have a quick warm up again into the upper 80s and maybe the low 90s. But then after that, we think maybe summer might be gone right. and we're ready for the break from the heat. Right. So today, like I said, we are back to bring you one of the uh, Q&A videos where we answer the questions that you guys specifically ask. We like to do these about once a month or so, and it just gives us a way to answer those questions that we get asked time and time again that we don't always have time to answer in a regular video. So we're going to get right at it. So the first question has to deal with the fact that we have two properties. We have our homestead property with our home, and then we have a second property, which is where we are now, which we call our farm property. And that both places are so beautiful. You guys don't know how we keep up with everything. Do we plan on continuing to expand or have we kind of reached our maximum capacity? Right, so the first part of that question is how do we keep up with everything? And the real truth to that is, we don't always keep up with everything. Uh, it's a lot of work having two places. In fact, uh, it's a lot more work than we ever thought it would be having two separate places. Not that we're complaining, we feel very blessed to have two awesome places pretty close to each other that we can go back and forth several times a day. Uh, but again, uh, the real answer to that question is we don't always keep up with everything. We try our hardest, we work a lot of hours. Uh, just to give you guys an example, in the summertime like we are now, just mowing the lawns and all of the things that need to be just mowed at both places, take a good 10 to 12 hours a week of just mowing and weed eating. So that eats away a lot of time just right there. And that's just kind of the bare minimum to keep things looking pretty decent. We've started moving a lot of the animals that we have had at the homestead property to the farm property. We still have all the pigs at the homestead property. And over time, you guys will continue to see us moving more and more things from the homestead property to the farm property because we've decided uh, that the farm property is where we would like to end up permanently. Right. And so we're going to be making that transition over the next year or two. And we've decided that ultimately we will end up selling the homestead property and then we'll be here full time on the farm property. Yeah, this property is a lot bigger than our other piece of property. This gives us the, ch the chance to raise cattle and everything else that we don't have room for on, on the homestead piece of property. So this is definitely where we want to end up. So you guys will slowly see that transition happening. We're excited about that and we really think it's gonna be a great thing to be down to just one place. There are things that need to be done at both places before all of that can happen. Right. Uh, there are things we need to do. We have a lot of junk. <laughs> and there are things that we need to do to the homestead property to get it ready for sale. And there are things that we need to do here at the farm property to get ready for us to move here. Right. Yeah, so none of that's gonna be a fast process, but to answer your question, we don't always keep up with everything. We try our hardest, and eventually we'd like to be down to just this one place. The next question we've actually gotten asked quite a few times in the last couple months, and that is, what in the heck are these things? I have one on my hat in most videos now, and Sarah has one on her shirt. These are new wireless microphones that we've been using now for probably six months yeah. or so and they work so well. They're called Rode Wireless Go Mics, and they just do an exceptional job. We really bought these when, shortly after we bought this second piece of property because we're kind of up on a hill here, and it's so windy all of the time, or most of the time, and these microphones actually do really well in the wind. 
One of the nice things about these microphones is this little fuzzy ball on it, and that really helps kind of diffuse the bursts of wind that we get and keeps the audio quality really good. A lot of times we don't talk about the equipment we use, but you guys have had a lot of questions right. about what this is. Right. The other nice thing about these is that we can get further away from the camera yeah. and you guys can still hear us. Or if we turn around, you can still hear us just as well as if we're facing the camera. So uh, that's what those are. Uh, the question came up many times, so yeah. we thought we would answer it. We recently got a question about the plant starts that we sell at the farmer's market. And that is really exciting to me because that means even though we're ending the growing season for the summer, some of you are already excited for next growing season. And you know what? So am I. And I'm still preserving some things from this year's garden. So we actually start a lot of plant starts in our greenhouses. Several we, thousand. Yeah, we take them to our local farmer's market in Ava, Missouri. And in the months of April, May, and sometimes the beginning of June, depending on how many plants we have, those are the months that we're at the farmer's market selling those plant starts. Right. One thing that always kind of frustrated us when we, before we did any of this, is that it seemed like a lot of people sold plants kind of at the wrong time of year. And so when we started selling plant starts, we've always tried to time our plants to be appropriate for the time of year that you can actually buy them, take them home and get them right in the ground. So uh, like we won't sell tomato plants in April when it's still way too early to be planting tomatoes. We'll hold those back in the greenhouse, make sure they're perfect so that when you buy them at the beginning of May, you can take them right home and plant them. So uh, like Sarah said, April, May, and maybe the beginning of June, but we try to time it to the seasons here in this part of the country. There are lots of things that you can plant in April. So when we're at the farmer's market in April, we're, bring, we're bringing lettuce, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, right. those kinds of things right. that the cooler are weather plants, yeah, yeah. better appropriate to be putting in the ground at that time of year. Right. Our basic rule of thumb here for our own farm and homestead is things like tomatoes and peppers and all of those warm season plants. We never put in the ground before May 15th, and that's what we recommend to the people who buy from us as well. The next question has to do with our chicken moat. Now in the winter or early, early spring, we double fenced around a one acre piece of property so that inside the fences, uh, we can have an orchard and do some other planting in there. We did a double fence around it to keep out the deer. And in order to maximize that space, so we weren't just wasting space, we decided to have our chicken run be in between those two double fences. Since we did that, and a lot of you have noticed that we've done that, we have gotten some questions about how it's going, basically. Um, one of the first questions about that system is, do the chickens ever get out of that fencing? Right. So uh, the, the quick answer is no, for the most part they don't. We do have one little silky hen who is allowed to go wherever she wants because she can fit right through the fence. She doesn't really get in any, any trouble and she doesn't go very far away because she likes to stay close to the rest of the flock. So we haven't worried about her getting in and out. We did have a couple other smaller hens when we first built the chicken moat that would get out and really uh, they were getting in some trouble. They were digging up all of Sarah's potted flowers. They were digging up other things that we were trying to grow in pots. So we actually gave those hens to one of our friends. And so after we got rid of those hens, we were left with only bigger bodied hens, which is really what we want to go to anyway, more dual purpose breeds. And those hens never get out. Right. So our main goal for chickens is to keep larger bodied kind of dual purpose type of chickens so that they just end up being too big to get through there and they don't try very hard. Either. Right. We've also had a lot of questions about whether or not they actually go all the way around because like that, that run area or that chicken moat area is about six feet wide and it ended up being about 850 feet long all the way around that one acre of land. And so you guys were asking if they actually go all the way around. Uh, they, they do on occasion. In the real hot summer, we've noticed that they tend to stay closer to their coop and closer to the water. Uh, but on the cool evenings and now that the weather is starting to cool down on occasion, then we see them really venture out. So my guess is as we get more into fall that they really are gonna go more around that all the time. 
um, but in the real hot summer, they like to stick closer to their to their coop. We also had questions um, about the shade that we provided for the chickens. We were hoping to be able to grow some fast growing vines that would grow up trellises that we put in several areas around the chicken moat. Um, they didn't grow fast enough to really do any good for shade for them. Uh, so we've got, lots of, we've got lots of questions about, so if that shade system didn't work, what shade did we provide? The majority of the hot part of the day, they were in two places. They were either in their coops. There are two different coops. They have tons of ventilation. It's really open and nice and airy, but it does have full shade, so they would spend time in there. Uh, there is also a shaded area that we created over one of the waterers, uh, so they could go get a drink of water and um, get underneath there for some shade also. And then the final question we've been getting a lot about the chicken moat area is, have we noticed a decrease in the number of bugs inside like in the orchard area and stuff uh, the real truth to that is it's too soon to tell we didn't do enough gardening and growing down here this year yet to really know whether or not having that moat area all the way around is gonna make a difference on the bugs so uh, that's gonna be a longer term experiment to see uh, maybe we need to get more chickens in there maybe we need to get more ducks in there so we'll let you know over the once we move everything down here uh, once we move our garden and everything we'll see if we have less bugs here than we did up at the homestead. Now to clarify, we don't let the chickens and the ducks inside the growing area. So like the orchard and the garden and right. where we're gonna put berries. So they don't free range in there. But the thought process with the bugs is those bugs that would want to cross through that chicken moat area into the orchard or the garden areas, the chickens might be able to keep down those numbers. Now they're never gonna keep out the ones that are just gonna fly right over right. there and get into those areas. But uh, that was a thought process of other people who had considered and have done this kind of chicken moat system around their gardens. Right. My real gut feeling on it is it probably isn't going to make a big difference, but hey, if it even makes a little bit of a difference, it's better than not having it at all. Speaking of bugs, we've had quite a few questions um, about the ladybugs that we put on our tomato plants this year. Uh, this year, for some reason, we had a pretty big aphid and whitefly infestation in our tomatoes. And so we ordered online uh, like 10,000 or 20,000 yeah, um, ladybugs and we released them on our tomato plants. We've had people that have wanted follow up on that if they helped, if it worked. Um, and I would say that they definitely worked. Yeah. Uh, they took care of almost 100%. I'd probably say 95% of all of the aphids and the white flies right. were taken care of. Um, after that infestation was taken care of, though, the um, ladybugs just kind of disappeared and right. went I still other see places. a few every once in a while, maybe a few more than we would have just naturally. But yeah, again, I think. Once their big food source in our garden right. was gone, they pretty much took off and went to look for food somewhere else or died or something. I never okay. saw many dead ones though, no. so I'm thinking they just flew away and looked for food somewhere else. But they definitely did do the job in the garden and that was exciting because it was a real natural way to take care of that problem. And, and to be honest, like white flies and stuff, they're a real pain to try mm -hmm. to kill with like soap and everything else. Cause if you don't get every single one, they just kind of keep coming back. So the ladybugs did a much better job, I think, than any kind of spray would have ever done. Absolutely. I think it was definitely worth the investment this year. And I think had we not done the ladybugs, we may have lost all of our tomato plants. Yeah. And instead, it turned out to be another great tomato season. Yeah, it really was off to a rocky start. It was. So I think they did a great job. The next question came a lot in just the most recent video that Sarah did about making ketchup. It was about the type of tomatoes that we grow. They kind of have goofy names and sometimes they're hard to pronounce, hard to find. People don't know how to spell them. So we got a lot of questions asking about what exactly are those tomatoes called because they're really great paste tomatoes. And most importantly, where can you get them? Right. So I grow or we grow paste tomatoes for making tomato sauce and barbecue sauce and ketchup. And paste tomatoes are great because they have a lot less water in them, unlike a slicer that you would slice and put on your um, sandwich nice and juicy. The paste tomatoes have less water, which means they boil down really nicely. They end up to be really nice and thick, uh, great for sauces. 
So the reason why people were asking about what types of tomatoes is because I showed how large they were. They're about right. as big as my hand, and a lot of them are that size. Such good tomatoes, and that's why I grow them too, is because I get like a lot of tomato, and I don't have to have as many to make um, a lot right. of sauce. We tried a lot of varieties before we settled on the two that we grow now. We did. So the two types that we grow are opalka, which is spelled O-P-A-L-K-A, -A, and we get those seeds from totallytomato.com. Right. The second variety that we're growing now is called Salvaterra Select, and we get those seeds from Seed Saber. It's Salvaterra's yeah. Select, yeah. right? Exactly, Salvaterra's Select right. from Seed Savers. Both of these tomatoes are heirloom varieties, which I love. Uh, and that means that you can hold back and save those seeds for next year. So really, you'd only have to buy those seeds one time. Right. So there you go. Now you know how to spell them, how to pronounce them, and where to get them. Now there is one last thing that I want to show you guys before we wrap this video up. But we're going to have to go outside for that. Something I'm super excited about. Let's go for a little bit of walk. So look at this, you guys. A full hay barn. Just this last weekend, or maybe the weekend before, we got our second cutting of hay for the season. And I'm so excited about how much hay we got. So this year, we ended up with 145 large round bales of hay off of our own hay field. Now, we don't cut the hay. We actually have a great neighbor who comes and cuts the hay. He cuts it on the halves, which means he gets to keep half and we get to keep half. So we got 45 bales the first time and 27 bales the second time. Plus, we still had some left from last winter, so we are stocked up. We are going to have plenty of hay to get our cattle through the winter, and hopefully even some more to hold over for next year so that we're always ahead of the game. Well, we love doing these types of videos for you guys because there are always questions that come up that we don't think about answering in some of our videos, either because it's just something that, you know, for us, we do every day, we don't really think about, but that you guys have questions about. So, again, uh, yeah, we love doing these types of videos. If you have questions that you want answered in future Q&A type videos, leave those in the comments below. We do always refer back. We can't answer them all, but we always try to pull questions for the next Q&A from the one that we're just doing. You guys, if you're enjoying this video and all the rest of our videos, we'd love for you to hit the subscribe button below. And as always, the best way that you can help us here on the homestead is just to share our videos on your social media. Until next time, thank you so much for stopping by your homestead. Take care and God bless. God bless.